Okay, it's my pleasure this evening to uh, introduce Amanda Wilkins. Uh, many of you uh, know Amanda. She was, as Chris said, she was an intern. Um, she's a, a senior, be graduating, I think, at the end of the fall semester in 2013. Um, she uh, has an interest in public gardens and, and actually has a um, has experiences to prove it. Um, before she was an intern for us, she had uh, uh, was an intern at Sarah P. Duke Gardens in uh, the summer of uh, 2010. And uh, she also, among a lot of the other things that she's done uh, while a student at NC State, she was the technician editor-in-chief, which is the, the newspaper for uh, campus, the, the student newspaper, which is, you know, really a lot of extracurricular there, I'm sure. Uh, so then, uh, summer of uh, uh, 2011, she was an intern here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Um, she's also um, worked at, as a garden manager at the uh, Duke uh, Le, Le Muir, Le Muir, Lemur Center. Lemur, I can't get it said right. Uh, Lemur Center, that's, that's other primates, right? Okay. And um, she also helped us with our first horticulture uh, science um, summer institute program. Uh, some of us called it the Hissy Program, but uh, uh, <laughs> our Summer Institute program, it was the first one we had for recruiting horticulture students uh, that were uh, rising sophomores, and juniors, seniors in, uh, in high school. Uh, so she helped us a lot with that program, getting that going um, during the time. Uh, more recently, uh, through the uh, summer of 2012, she spent at uh, Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden as an intern there, um, and uh, also did another stint uh, after coming back into these parts of uh, the world uh, in, in December. Um, she spent basically August through November on a 10-week uh, internship in a place called Hawaii. Um, <laughs> and um, basically a 10-week long internship on Kauai and Maui. Uh, and uh, did a lot of things there that she's going to tell us about. And she's going to tell us also uh, a couple of things like uh, why Hawaiians don't eat pineapple, and um, what is a tico? So we're interested in what, what those things are going to be. So Amanda, come on up and give us a talk. This is my first time ever giving a lecture here at the Arboretum. I've been to plenty of them, and so it's kind of, it's kind of nice to be on this side and see everybody's smiling faces. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out today. Um, so like everybody said, my name is Amanda Wilkins, and I'm a senior in horticultural science here. Um, hopefully I'll be graduating in December, that's the plan. Um, and so this lecture is about pretty much the last seven months of my life. Um, I left, basically left Raleigh in uh, May last year, and haven't come back until last week. <laughs> um, so I spent three weeks um, in May and June in Costa Rica, um, learning about, uh, in general, about that. Then I did an internship uh, two days later at um, the Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden. And then two days later after that, I went to Hawaii and did an internship. So it's been a, a whirlwind year. So just to tell you guys a little bit about, I'm from Belmont, North Carolina, uh, which is a little bit west of Charlotte. And uh, so I did a little bit of calculations to see how far I actually traveled and see how far we're traveling today. And uh, so Costa Rica, about where we were at, is about 1,700 miles away from where I live. Daniel Stowe is about 10 miles away from my house. And then Kauai and Maui is about 4,700. So we're looking at about 6,000 miles, so I have to go about 100 miles a minute to get through this and then try to get you guys out of here. I'm sure you don't want to be here all night. So uh, this is Costa Rica. It's north of Panama, uh, south of Nicaragua. And uh, we spent three weeks traveling over the top, the northern half of this uh, country. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, we started out in San Jose and basically did this cool swirl motion and ended up back in um, Liberia. Anyways, so to kind of get us started, um, our first day, for our first couple days there, we went to a tomato place. And so this is something that was really familiar to us. Um, and they were growing tomatoes underneath um, in greenhouses. And they were, it was really cool because they were all so, so tall. And the gentleman who was actually growing them was from Florida and they had moved their business there because they could produce the tomatoes much better in Costa Rica. So we also met some stuff that we did not really know about. Uh, this is a grandia, and this was probably my favorite fruit that we had the entire time there. Um, we know it's a passion, a passion fruit, um, and so it has this really cool outer core, but the inside is this nasty, goopy-looking stuff on the right side. And 
it, it wouldn't look like much if you didn't, you know, weren't really brave, but once you taste it, it's sweet and crunchy, and it's really good. You just have to be brave about it. So our first uh, real trip while we were there, we stayed in San Jose the night, and then the next morning we got up really early and went, we went to um, Irazu Volcano, uh, which this is my first time ever going to a volcano in my entire life, and first time being in Costa Rica, so it was just this amazing, just I was so overwhelmed and saw so many plants on the side of the road going up, you know, Brian Jackson's joke is identifying plants 60 miles an hour. I was totally doing that the entire way of this volcano. <laughs> Um, and so this is the crater of the lake, and it, you really can't get a sense of the scale of this. This is me, or this is, yeah, this is me standing up on a fence, stopping people from going down the hill, and this is looking down, but it's so huge that you can't even tell like, how big this is. Anyway, so as you can tell, we have a great diversity of plants up here. It was incredible. And the one plant I was so excited about was, let's see where, was the gutter. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I, you come in to it, you came into the parking lot, and you see the, the bathrooms. They had little baby gunner plants, and as soon as I saw that, the whole volcano is surrounded by them, and I was flipping out. I could not even get over it, because all I had heard was from when the Hort Club had gone to England, and they told us stories of these huge gunner plants that could hide behind the leaves. And then I'm like, wait, that's it. It's everywhere. Oh my goodness. So this is a picture of um, Angel hugging a gunner plant for me. And this is another plant that was all over the place. It was absolutely beautiful. It had this great purple foliage, these great flowers, and I could not find the name of it, but I think it's a little uh, tropical lobelia. No? Tim's giving me the no. Might be an Indian paintbrush. Indian paintbrush? Maybe. Mm, I'm not saying I, uh, Anyways, we're guessing it's a lobelia. It was really cool. It was all over the place. <coughs> we're coming back down, and on the one the side of the volcano that we're coming down was the most fertile land because, of course, you got the wind taking the volcanic soil off, and so all this horticultural land they were growing onions and potatoes and things. But one of the things that really struck me is they had this greenhouse complex on a hill. This thing was like this, and I had never seen anybody try to attempt to build a greenhouse structure on a 45 degree angle. And apparently, it's, it's a little bit in disrepair, but you know, kudos to them for going at it. And so we went down from the volcano, we drove through, we went through a couple cities, and then our first lunch place, I sat down and looked to my right, and this is what I saw. And that, that's when I knew I was really, really in the right place. All around here, right here, you can't tell, but these are bananas. And the road kind of does this whole number like this all through here. And most of the roads, it's, you know, two lanes, the whole country, but you don't have very many choices. You got that road or no road. <laughs> Um, coffee plantations, it was, so this is what we, we ate, we ate a lot of black beans and rice, um, and a little bit of salad, but salad for them is usually chopped up cabbage, but, you know, we ate black beans and rice every day, loved every minute of it. <laughs> so after we left that lovely restaurant, I'm of course like on my gunnera high at this point, <laughs> and, uh, and I walk out and I'm looking at the trees and there's orchids everywhere. Orchids are my favorite plant in the entire world. And so I'm flipping out that all these orchids are just growing just as you see them in the trees with no help. And then I see this one. So this gentleman is, uh, this is Sam. He's a little bit taller than I am. And this plant is about a foot and a half taller than him. This is Arundina uh, graminifolia. It is uh, basically, they call it the cane orchid. So you can see the tiny little things here. but an orchid taller than a person? Okay, I'm sold. So the next day um, was my first trip to the rainforest. And I, if you haven't already noticed, I love tropical plants. It's one of my favorite things in the world. And so this was my first actual trip to a tropical place. And it was, it was just amazing. So we walk out, we get out of our van, or out of our bus, and there's a blue morpho flying down the road. And I was like, whoa. We check in, we get our we get our tickets, and we start walking, and you just you're walking through this the entire time, and you know everybody else is pretty much plowing through, and I'm down here, you know, taking pictures like a mad person, um, but it was it was definitely worth you know going much much slower, um, and at one point we actually well we came here to see the ruins, 
and uh, we saw along the trail we saw this little um, it was a burial site and it had been uncovered so it was just basically this cavern looking thing but a huge tree had grown out of it and Juan our, um, our driver was walking behind with us to make sure that we were safe and didn't find any snakes um, mm -hmm. and he told us I didn't know English but I mean didn't know Spanish but um, Zenia, who was another girl that was with us, translated for me and he told us that this tree that was growing out of this um, basically burial site had the souls of the people who were buried there. Mm -hmm. And the whole place, you know, was you know, a very sacred place for these people. So, uh, like I said, snakes. Um, <laughs> snakes were a big thing. Actually, um, uh, Dr. Michelle Schroeder Moreno is here and Wayne Parrott was our other advisor. And, Wayne would get so mad at me because I would go up to a plant without just looking at it and making sure there were any snakes there. Um, but I didn't find this one, this one didn't find me. Um, the people who had plowed forward were coming to look over and someone had sat down and this guy was sitting about, I don't know, two feet behind him. And someone looked, was looking at him like, that looks a little weird. And they're like, whoa, that's a snake. Um, so this is a hognose viper, hognose viper, and this is a baby. So. We're guesstimating if some, if the person who had sat down, I'm not sure who it was, I don't want any names, if they'd been bitten, they probably would have, probably would have been very sick or died because we were way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, super cool that we had to watch out for snakes. So this is what we had come to see um, in this particular place. It was basically, basically mounds left over, but what really struck me were the, um, were the roads. Um, the Costa Rican civilizations, um, old civilizations, were actually very advanced, um, for, especially for um, uh, Central American civilizations, and they had developed roads independent of a lot of places, and so this was was pretty incredible. Um, and this was our first experience with leafcutter ants, leafcutter ants everywhere. So we were walking through the forest really slow, and Zenny and I saw this huge, like, open place in the in the rainforest. And it was just this huge mound of red dirt, about mm -hmm. 10 feet by 12 feet, the hilly dirt, and there were ants everywhere, bringing leaves back to it. And they were so efficient, and they used them so often, that you could tell the trails. They actually made trails in the grass. They walked it so often. Okay, so a couple days later, um, we did get to go to one botanical garden, and I was beside myself, because, yeah, botanical garden. Um, so this is at Katye which is a graduate school um, in Costa Rica. And they have a really great um, uh, plant collection there. And I'm, I was familiar with the Morton Palace Titania, but um, everybody else was like, whoa, what is this? And you know, they were going up to it and touching it, and you know, it has this really cool texture. Um, and then about two minutes later, they realized they were getting bitten. And there were <laughs> ant piles all in, all in the bed. Um, but it was kind of cool to see everybody's first amorphophallus uh, experience. Good thing we didn't see the flower. Anyways, also at Cartier um, is a germplasm um, repertory of various um, economic plants in Costa Rica. They had coffee, they had a little bit of everything. But this is um, Vixa aurela or um, achote, achote. And this one, you know, there were probably like a uh, hundred or two of these plants, but they're all from different parts of the world. It's what a germplasm um, repository is. And but this one was the most floriferous and the most um, fruit, uh, had so much fruit on it. And I had to get a picture of it because it stood out among all of them. And if anybody, if you don't know, Vixa is what gives your cheddar cheese the yellow color. Um, it also has this great um, effect <laughs> of being able to make a, it, it basically like orange crayon that stains a lot, <laughs> which they didn't know at the time, but everybody like pretty much made like designs all over their bodies, and you could tell a couple weeks later when we left that their shirts were still orange from <laughs> So if anybody doesn't know what this is, this is one of my favorite plants in the entire world. Um, also there, they had a germplasm of Chocolate! So this was my first time ever seeing a chocolate plant in fruit. Like I had seen them um, in conservatories, but so Angel is here uh, exhibiting her lovely tribal oh, colors here. <laughs> <laughs> Passing out um, the fruit of the cacao. So what we actually look for when we have chocolate is the bean, but before it's processed it has this 
kind of like milky, nasty looking uh, pulp around it, but it's so good. Mm -hmm. It's almost as good as the chocolate itself. It's got this sour, sweet and thing that you can just suck on for a while. And so we were sucking on that for a while while Wayne was trying to tell us about it, but I think we were just so excited about the fruit that, yeah. <laughs> so after that, we, um, they brought us, we had lunch, and we, they brought us to um, a mountain. They said, oh, we have to climb up this mountain. And they really didn't tell us how big the mountain was, but they said, you know, at the top of this mountain is a dairy farmer who, you know, does specialty cheeses and he feeds his cows mulberry instead of other things. So I'm like, okay, we got this. Um, about 45 minutes later, we finally get to the top of this mountain and we're like, man, we didn't know it was that far up. Um, so what this gentleman does, he does dairy, but instead of letting his uh, cattle roam, he keeps them in a barn and he has a concrete sub so he can wash the concrete sub, but he feeds them mulberry. Um, and the reason that he does that is because you can produce, it's a perennial plant, so you can chop it off, harvest the, the leaves and foliage, but it'll come back. And so he has about 30 or so acres, I think is what it was, planted with just mulberry so that he can come through and harvest every so often to feed his cattle. And this conserves the land because he is on such a, I mean, this, you can't even tell how steep this is. You know, remember those greenhouses earlier? His land is steeper than that. And so if he actually let his cattle raise this, the land would become so degraded and so compacted that you wouldn't even be able to use it for marijuana. I think I have a picture. This is what the bales of mulberry look like. Um, this is what the land would end up looking like. And this is actually what we saw a lot of when we were in Costa Rica. You can see um, where the cattle trails are, and you can see how compacted terrace that is, and that's not how the land is supposed to look. Um, at this point, you, can, you can't really do much with it. Um, so he was trying to promote and show people that there are other ways besides letting your cattle graze in your land to raise your cattle. Um, but he was only one of, I think, two or three people in the entire country using it. So very cutting edge, and it, it worked. The cheese was awesome. We got some cheese. Really good. So of course, we had to have our coffee uh, tours. We did, I think, two or three of uh, various different coffee places, um, from a big producer to a middle producer to a small farmer who Show, uh, sells to a co-op. But um, one thing I'll say about this is in Costa Rica they have an interesting growing style that they plant two plants together and their thinking is is that the two plants will compete with each other and that will make them want to produce more and, hmm. and do other things and Michelle and I know that we look, gave each other some looks sometimes we're like hmm that doesn't sound quite right but, <laughs> but that, that's, that is the cultural way of doing coffee there. So probably one of my favorite places that we went was Earth University. So we went to Katia, which is a graduate school, and Earth University is a um, undergrad school, it's a university that was built by um, the United States government along with other charitable foundations. And what they do is they invite um, 100 students from 100 different countries around the developing world, and they give them an education on community development skills, agriculture, pretty much everything that you need to know, all the way from you know doing mass productions of crops all the way to building sewage systems. Very practical stuff. And so what we did while we were there, um, this is a picture of me helping um, Joey. We were building a biodigester for a small farmer to produce um, natural gas from his hog's um, sewage. And so what we were doing is we were using, these are actually five gallon um, ice cream buckets from the cafeteria at the university. And we're sawing them off and we, and dangled it into this huge biodigest that's about as big as this place right here. And they had dug, the farmer gets everything for free, but he dug the whole <coughs> biodigester. And we basically installed the biodigester for him while he was there, while we were there. Um, and these people are, they were very poor. They're living in a very small house. You know, they didn't have very much, but they were so gracious to us. Um, they made us, they, the lady, they did pineapple and they brought us out fresh pineapple that they had just picked. Um, and they brought us water and fruit juice and made us biscuits, I mean, stuff that was more than they should have provided us, and it was amazing. Um, and so another thing that we did, we did go out in the community. Um, we visited this lovely lady. Um, her name is Chapita. Um, her actual name is Josephine, but she wanted us to call her Chapita. And she was like our, our little Costa Rican grandmother. She was the sweetest lady, I think, in the entire world. Um, so what she does um, is she has about 10 acres of cacao 
that she grows. She has about nine or ten varieties of cacao. She's growing almost ten acres. And we came to her home. She showed us through her um, plantation. And every time we came to a new cacao variety, she'd pull one off the tree, conk it a couple times, crack it open. And while she was talking, we were, you know, <laughs> eating, eating fruit. And then, we, and then we would save it. We would put it back in the pod, eat it against the tree, and she would come back through and uh, process that later. But after we walked through her property, she brought us back into her home. Um, and she showed us how to make uh, hot chocolate and with fresh chocolate. So we ground it. She had like a grinder on her, um, attached to her uh, counter. And we ground coffee into a cast iron skillet. She made us this amazing hot chocolate. I'm talking, you've never had hot chocolate this in life. And then, my story gets better. After we had done that, she finished whatever we had left over. She put it in the cast iron skillet, added some powdered milk, some water, some seasoning, some spices, and she made this paste and what she called fudge, but it was just pretty much paste. Um, and when we were leaving, she gave us a little tub full of it and said, you know, just eat it, eat it with cookies. And so they gave it to me to hold, and I'm sitting there, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting there in the bus, and it smells amazing, and I'm like, we have to eat this. We, we did it like two, we, we were like driving for 10 minutes, I'm like, we have to eat this. And so they get out the cookies, and we're like scraping this thing out, I mean, so good, and so, we, uh, that particular day, we finished that. Everybody's uh, all full of chocolate and cookies, and we're all feeling really good. You know, chocolate makes you feel like you're in love. <laughs> Pure chocolate, you don't even know. So we're all we're all dipped out to do we're all dipped out to do um, a transect in the rainforest. It is hot, hotter than any hot I've ever experienced. Um, so we're all in long sleeve shirts and hats and long and pants and boots. We're all really happy and we're all really hot. By the time we finished this um, transect, um, we were all really wet and really smelly, but we were all really happy. <laughs> um, and this is one of um, the trees from the rainforest. This uh, forest was dominated by uh, Fibaceae, and so the way that we could tell we needed to leave is the leaves would close. When the leaves closed, we knew we had about 30 minutes of good daylight, and that was kind of the sign to we need to get back out of Dodge. <laughs> The next place we went was Mwamba, and it's this boat, uh, our boat ride out to um, an island, which is near Tortuguero. And uh, at this particular place, they had a red-eyed tree frog breeding program, and they would breed them, and then they had them for a display for tourists to come. It's a very touristy place. Um, and uh, so you could go see them. Typically, they didn't want you to hold them, but you know, we knew what we were doing, so. And of course, how could you not want to hold that? <laughs> Um, they also had iguanas there, and I had never really seen an iguana up close, like in the wild. This guy was particularly interesting because he was about seven feet long, and he just wandered around the grounds doing his own thing. You know, we'd come out, and he'd just be, you know, sitting there chilling. He climbs trees, too, I found out. Um, so that was really interesting. Uh, so this is, this was, we were on the Atlantic side. This is the Atlantic Ocean. Notice there's no one in the water. You do not go out in the ocean on the Atlantic side because you'll get swept out to sea. The currents are really bad on the Atlantic side of Costa Rica, but you can tell it's absolutely beautiful. So we walked through and we came to Tortuguero, which Tortuguero is known for um, the sea turtles. Um, the green sea turtles and other, actually other species of sea turtles come there and lay their eggs. Um, and in the past, before the Europeans came, the native peoples used to go out there and, and hunt the sea turtles and use them for food. Um, and the problem became, um, it became a problem when the Europeans came and said, hey, turtle soup is pretty good. And so they overfished them, and now we have this. And so the, right now, Portuguero is an ecotourist destination for people to learn about sea turtles and is a, also kind of a way to help the native peoples balance their needs for turtle and their needs for an income um, without having to harvest the turtles. This is my fun horticultural moment. We were walking through Tortuguero, and somebody had taken um, plastic bottles and attached them to wood and attached them to their chain of fence and had <laughs> herbs going through it. And I was like, I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that we did while we were there um, is we did boat tours in the morning. So really early in the morning, we'd get up like we'd be out there like 6:30, get in the boat, and doing <coughs> um, tours around this river. And we saw all sorts of things. This guy. You know, he was going, you know, 30, 40 miles an hour down this, this thing, and he would slow down and whip around. He would see a lizard this big in a tree. And we're like, how do you see that? You know, he could, he, but he could see them. Um, we also got to see some, uh, like, base capuchins, uh, capuchins, however you want to pronounce it. 
Um, and it was kind of a bittersweet story. They're really cute, um, did their thing, but there are so much, um, so many lodges and things in the area that this particular um, family group was actually raiding a trash can and eating the trash out of it. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was kind of a bittersweet thing to see. So this is uh, Turtle Mountain. What we know is Turtle Mountain. It's kind of hard to see because it's cloud. Um, but it's in the shape of the turtle, and the natives believed that the turtles came to that place because they saw this mountain that looked like a turtle, and that's how they knew to come back to it. And, uh, and this is actually a national park. Uh, you're not supposed to go up there. But while we were in town the day before, uh, Dr. Parrott uh, arranged for a boat to take us to this particular place, and so we could hike up this mountain illegally. Um, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. <laughs> But we, we were fortunate, it rained the night before, so by the time we made it halfway up, we were all covered in mud, but it was still fun. So, and we got to see these lovely little guys. They're about this big. They are um, blue jean tree frogs, and they're known for uh, that because usually they, have, they come up to here, but their legs are blue, they look like they're blue jeans. And these guys were out in full force. Uh, so this is at the top of, it was kind of a ledge and an overlook. Um, so we're at the top of Turtle Mountain, and here's the national park, and here's some houses, and some power lines, and a city that is not supposed to be there. <laughs> um, these people have uh, moved in, and they've been burned out twice, and they still keep coming back, and the government has actually provided electricity and education to them. And it's, it's kind of, it's a weird place because technically you're not supposed to be in a national park, but technically if there's an, uh, a t city, the government is entitled to give those things to you. So one of those problems with the, the uh, legislation there. So this is another overlook that we saw um, at La Ensenada, which is on the Pacific side of the country. And this was as the sun was going down. Sadly, it was a little bit of a cloudy day, but it was still beautiful. So this particular place is a 140-acre cattle farm, but they also do tourist things. Um, Really great lodges, beautiful, and we also did some boat tours here. But this little guy, um, he's about as big as my hand, and we were eating dinner one night, and um, we heard this plop on the ground. And this guy just landed smack on the ground. It sounded like someone had just, you know, it was crazy. And so I pick him up, and we're, we're all looking at him, and Miguel's like, trying to poke him and having a good old time. But the, all the enclosures there are pretty much open, so we ate in the open air most of the time. And, we have geckos and things wander around. Oh, that guy was kind of fun. So one of the other things we did is we took a boat tour and we got to see the red and black mangroves um, along the coast of their property. Um, and if you've ever, never seen a mangrove, it's they're pretty. It's pretty awesome. And also in this place, we got to see a lot of birds. We got to see a whole flock of um, what were they? Magnificent frigates up close. Which if you've ever seen magnificent frigates, about this big, this huge red or um, white uh, chest and they are magnificent. Um, like I said earlier, we did transects and this was the last place that we did a transect in the woods. I did find a spider in this particular place. It was this big and it freaked me out, but I also found an orchid, so I was pretty happy. <laughs> it was the one place I found an orchid in a transect. Um, anyways, I won't tell you my other spider story because I just don't have enough time. So another place we went to was La Pacifica, which is in the Guanacaste, uh, Guanacaste area. Um, in this particular instance, of course, you know, as you can tell, these are leaf cutter ants. But Juan, one night, walked, was walking back to his uh, cabin, and he's like, he comes running back. He's like, you have to see this. You have to see this. This is a colony of leaf cutter ants taking down a tree. They, during the day, they usually scope out a tree every now and then. And this particular night, these guys were taking down a tree that w that was across the road from their their mound, and so. You can't see it, there are like three distinct lines of guys carrying these, and then in between there are people running, or ants going back towards the tree, and they were just like a river going, I mean there was a, a fence, they went over the fence, they went up the tree. Um, so we're like, oh this is so cool, and so we're walking up to it and you're pointing at it. Right here um, are the army ants, which yeah. protect everybody working over here, and they're clawing up our legs and biting us, so we quickly backed off at that point. <laughs> Um, for our last week there, we uh, stayed at the UGA campus in Costa Rica. Um, they do a lot of different programs out there. They rent these places out. Um, this is our bus, Turismo, if you're tourists. Um, but this is the cloud forest area, and so we um, whole host of different plants. And Monteverde, 
if anybody's been to Costa Rica, they've probably been to Monterey, it's over here. Um, this is where we stayed, and the UGA campus kind of is in this area right here, and there's a trail that we took that's about right here um, up to a waterfall. The waterfall was really cold, but after we hiked up there, it was real nice. This is the Monteverde area. We were on an eco tour, and you can't go on an eco tour without doing zip lining. So we went zip lining through Monteverde, um, and this is a view of the treetops. And the amazing thing about cloud forest is most of the time people confuse cloud forest with tropical rainforest. And so this is where all your orchid diversity is, and all your bromeliads and your mosses and all of your canopy stuff. You find a lot of it here in these places, um, and it was incredible. Incredible. Finally. Um, I'll tie that up. This is Will. This is a drawing that he made of a hubcap shop. Um, three pregnant dogs riding a motorcycle over a cow in the road. <laughs> this, <laughs> we did a lot of bus traveling while we were there, and so one of the things that they gave us to do was a scavenger hunt. So every day we'd get about 10 or 15 things to look for while we were riding through the countryside. And um, I was doing pretty good today, but Will wasn't. I think he slept a lot of the time. And so in, in an effort to get some points, these were some things on the list. And so he did this drawing in hopes of getting three or four points out of it, of which he did not. And, <laughs> but he tried. I ended up winning the contest, though, and I won a mouse and machete, which is over there if you want to go look at it. <laughs> so I'll go through this really quick. Um, after I got back from Costa Rica, I had two days off, and then I started working again. And um, I, did, I was actually their education intern. I did their children's programs over the summer. but. I did get once a week to work in the Orchid Conservatory, which when this opened in my hometown, I was ecstatic because there was really nothing like this before 2008 in this area. And so this has is a lot of access for people who aren't even familiar with tropical plants. Um, sadly, this is a picture of it a couple weeks ago. Um, the last day of my Hawaiian trip, I lost my hard drive with all my photos. So these are the photos that I could rally up and some of them I took in effort to show you guys. So this is the... Uh, um, opening and when you come in you're immediately smacked and hit in the face with orchids and I love this one because this oncidium is really large if you've ever seen an oncidium most of the flowers are about this big this one was like this big and I was like whoa so, anyways so when I got back from Costa Rica you know I was really kind of you know down about it um, because I missed it and had been there for a long time but then I went in the conservatory and I saw this and I'm like that's a chocolate flower and I looked up and there's a chocolate tree, and I'm like, oh, Costa Rica, this is great. <laughs> um, they have a huge, really big uh, chocolate tree. Sadly, it will not set fruit in this place, but at least they have it, and it's a good teaching tool. Then I turned around, and there was a sappy stuff, in this, you know, uh, flowers, and I'm like, what is that? And I looked up, bananas. It's like, oh, home, okay, I'm good. Got my Costa Rica fix. Um, also, if you guys don't learn anything else from my lecture, Please learn that you should only buy organic bananas. Hmm. You can buy nothing else organic. Do organic bananas. It's worth every 30 extra cents that you pay a pound to get organic bananas. Because I've seen what conventional bananas do to the land. Just take my word for it. Do organic. Hey, that's nice. So there's two main orchid displays. This is the orchid tree. Um, and right now, at this time of year, it's full of vondas because vondas are blooming this time of year. And all over the place. I mean, all sorts of different kinds. Ali Potts is the orchid curator, and he hangs them everywhere. All sorts of different kinds. Um, anything that he can pull that's flowering. One of my favorites is this Calia Wakarina variety princeps, and it smells amazing. It forms really cool ball. There's our there's our mamba. Um, so speaking of cool plants stashed in cool places, um, this is a bulbophyllum species that I saw tacked to a wall in a corner. And no one would have ever seen it if they didn't know what to look for. But these are, this is a flower inflorescence of just clump, clump flowers. And these are the petals all coming down. Mm. Um, so as you come around the corner, this is what you see. And this tree. So in this tree, he has more orchid stash. Now this particular orchid is about, you know, four inches tall. This flower is about four inches tall. And if you weren't looking for it, if you look up, you wouldn't have seen it. And it opens this huge star cape, um, shaped flower. Sally is what I do not have a picture of. This is another cool orchid that's stashed in a cool place. This guy's only about this long, and the flower inflorescences are about this long, and the flowers, which are these little things right here, are about as big as my fingernail. 
And so this is a view of the orchid wall, which is what most people, I love, I love standing in the orchid conservatory and listening to new people come. They come around the corner and just go, oh, wow. Because it's just so, I mean, it's right in your face, and it's just so cool, the diversity of orchids that they have there. Um, they also have this lovely imperial bromelia, which has our um, resident tree frog. This gentleman lived in the, um, the conservatory this summer, and the kids loved him. Absolutely loved him. Finally, they have these arches um, there, full of plansias, and um, I had the pleasure of helping the other intern with horticulture take down all the plansias on this particular one, clean all the dead foliage off, and stick them all back up on there. <laughs> And actually, my friend Jennifer helped me with that too. And that was that was about four weeks worth of work. Welcome. But what a display! When they're all in flower, it's worth it. So finally, the what you've all been waiting for. Um, I'm gonna get through this. Um, so I did eight weeks on Kauai and two weeks on Maui, and I'll just start off kind of prefacing. So it was about an 18-hour trip. I left 8:30 in the morning here and arrived about. 3.30 in the morning our time, there, 10 o'clock at night their time, and I was dead. I was dead. And so I went to bed and I slept for 12 hours and I woke up and I'm like, I have to go outside. I don't remember anything from last night, but I have to go outside. And this is what greeted me. Um, our intern grandmother, this is outside of her house, and what an amazing way to start the internship. This uh, particular mountain range right here, if you go a couple miles in, um, Mount Wai Ale Ale, which is the wettest point on Earth, I live there. So anyways. So I'm like, oh, this is incredible. You know, her, the view from her place is incredible. We go to our house. This is the view from my back door. Um, so right here is the valley that goes down to the ocean, and around the corner is the garden. So I'm like, oh, man, i got to walk around the yard. I see this in bloom in the backyard. And I see at least three other species of uh, hibiscus. And uh, it's incredible. So this is the view of my backyard. Um, another wonderful mountain in the back distance, and this is my window right here. So I got that the entire time I was there for free. They paid us to work there. And of course, but we had to deal with the chickens. Yes, this is a chicken tree, and yes, Kauai is covered in chickens. Yes, they make a lot of noise. And yes, chickens do cross the road to get to the other side. <laughs> also outside our house, we had a lily koi vine, which is another uh, species of passion flower. And, uh, this is what it looks like inside. Uh, a lot more, uh, a lot prettier looking, a little more sour than the Grandia, and I think I like the Grandia better, but we ate tons of this while we were there. Um, so along with the house, they paid us, and they gave us a car to drive. So this is our lovely car we drove. And this was our lovely work schedule. Uh, not really. If, if you read this, if you actually read this out, you actually do, you actually do about two hours worth of work according to the schedule. And, I, and I'm not going to lie, there were about four days where we got about three hours of work done for an eight hour work day. So it's almost like this. But anyway, this is what we usually ended up looking like after the day was done. Um, yes, this is us after hauling rocks a whole day. Yes, we did haul rocks from the top of the mountain down the bottom of the mountain. And luckily, it was from up to down, not down to up. Um, we also did some familiar work. Tim, I put this one in for you because it's everybody's favorite job. Oh, gee. Um, this is usually what I ended up looking like at the end of the day. I actually have a washcloth over there that I came to Hawaii with. It was completely beautiful, pristine white. I could not bleach that thing enough to get the dirt out. It has stained this lovely brown color. And it was always, always stained up the entire time I was there. And we had a beautiful place to work. Um, this is the native section right here um, in the valley. And over here is the canoe garden. And if anybody's ever seen Jurassic Park, um, the, the scene where they're all running with the herd, this is where the herd was. So this is the McBride garden. And this is the Allerton garden. Not a no relation to Tim whatsoever. Um, this is their house right here, which you're not, I did not know you're not supposed to take a picture of. We've got tons of pictures of it. Um, and we have palms planted out on uh, the side of it, so this was our private beach the entire time we were there. So we took a walk the first day to give you guys a little bit of overview of the plants. This is a scavola takata, um, which is a common coastal plant, but the only scavola I've ever seen is, you know, the budding plant. I think it's about yay big, with little pretty purple flowers. Some of you probably had in your yard. Um, this one was a full-size bush. This guy, you know, got this big to this big, depending on where he was. Um, and the cool thing about this plant is this plant stops your goggles from bogging up. If you ever go snorkeling, 
break off a leaf, crunch it up, put it in your goggles, you never have to worry about fogging. Don't ever use the chemical stuff at this point. And this orchid has like, the best view in the world. And I was so excited when I saw orchids growing everywhere. They didn't even have to tie them to things. They just set them. They had a wall. They just set them. Took them out of the pot, set them down, and they grew. So bad. Anyways. So this is our, this was our uh, garden for eight weeks. And this is another view of the Allerton Garden. Now, the McBride Garden was more of a naturalized garden. Um, and then the Allerton Garden was actually a landscaped um, garden by the Allertons. Um, they were big landscape designers, and they had landscaped their entire property, spent probably more money than the Biltmores, or I mean, the Vanderbilts ever thought about putting in a Biltmore. Um, and this, their vision was, they built it back in World War II, but their vision has become something that I don't even think that they could have imagined it had become. The reason I'm showing you this picture is this particular area was designed to be like a big um, grand hall um, and emulating a forest. And so if you can't tell right here, there's a different planting of undergrowth here to emulate a stream. And it had started on an area that we walked along along the path, just like a stream. Uh, so this is going up. They had statuary all throughout the garden. Um, and of course, our more bay figs. Um, they have several of them in the garden. These particular ones are famous because, um, if you've ever seen Jurassic Park again, uh, the eggs were right here when they started hatching. <laughs> so a little bit about the wildlife. Um, so you guys heard my, um, my chicken story. Well, this is the native um, duck. Uh, it's called, um, uh, oh my goodness, gallinule, gallinule, because I always remember gallinule. Anyway, the gallinule. And it makes this really strange honking noise. It almost sounds like a toy. Um, and they live in the stream that was in there, and we'd always hear them honking. Um, so this is a sunset from my first day. I'm off to a pretty darn good start. <coughs> so 10 weeks of this. And so while we were there, we, we did a lot of stuff, but we had to deal with a lot of um, invasive plants. Uh, this is a philodendron uh, hillside. Philodendron, the leaves are this big um, house plant. You guys probably have in your house. Um, has taken over, and this is this is basically the Hawaiian kudzu. is what I call it because it's about that invasive and aggressive. This is a night blooming cirrus. Most Hawaiians love this plant and know it, um, but it is also very invasive, but very beautiful. And it only blooms. Um, finally, this is a kukui nut, which is the native, uh, which is the state tree of Hawaii. It is not a native tree to Hawaii. The Polynesians brought it with them as one of the canoe plants. Um, and they also call it candle nut because the, the native Hawaiians use it as a candle. They would burn it and burn slowly. They use it as a sunscreen. Um, the juice that comes out of it, you can also use it as a sunscreen. Yes, Hawaiians burn, but you may not know that. Um, so they would use it, but it's gotten out of hand. It grows along stream sides now, um, and it's pretty much the dominant tree. And it's very invasive too. Uh, so this is where all the magic happens. This is our uh, growing center, and the NTBG works with um, the state agencies to grow native and rare Hawaiian plants. And so a lot of the plants that are in here have 700 to 100 to 50 to 10 individuals left in the wild. Um, so very important work. Uh, so all these growing seed beds, they have this cage here because of rats. Rats are a huge problem in Hawaii, and it's one of I would say, after learning everything that I've learned, it's probably one of the main reasons why all the native plants are in decline, because the rats leave the seeds and disrupt the natural cycle. Mm -hmm. The plants did not evolve with um, rats, so they actually put these up here to protect the Pachardia from the Speaking of Pachardia, this is the native uh, Hawaiian palm. It used to be the dominant palm. Huge, massive forests of it, um, it's huge. This is one of the um, medium-sized ones to give you guys some scale. Dane, who we really will see a lot of, <laughs> um, is a little bit taller than me uh, to give you guys some scale. And they had the fortune of being able to grow in volcanic rock. They would sow seeds in volcanic rock and stuff would grow. It's not fair. Anyway, so this particular plant in this pot is a Flugia neo... Well, I'm not going to say that. Anyways, the thing that you need to know about this is this used to be the largest tree in Hawaii. It was the dominant hardwood tree. It has a really dense wood, really pretty. They used to use it for weapons. Um, and now there are less than 70 individuals in the wild. This particular gentleman was saved from a population that is not there anymore. 
um, and it's actually in slow decline. Um, the cool thing, it's in the four PAC. But I have a better story. This is this is a hopeful story. This is Brickhamia insignis, or a lula, or I call it cabbage on a stick because it looks like a cabbage on a stick. And um, but back in the 70s, when they were really starting to do like conservation programs at the garden, the um, the current director and another gentleman who was doing programs um, rappelled down a 200 foot cliff and or jumped out of a helicopter to har or pollinate and harvest seeds off of these plants to make sure that they were, they would um, be able to procreate. And so back in the 70s, this population was about 200 individuals at the time. So they went there, pollinated, got seed off of it, brought it back. Um, they, um, one of the researchers showed us a picture of the place that it was at in the 70s and the place that it looks like now. There were about you know, 200 then, there are two now, just to give you guys some uh, perspective. But these guys in the up and up, um, the only things they have a problem with now are snails in the greenhouse, but getting better. See, we've got some good looking individuals here. So, good apps. So here's our Bichardi uh, Hilbrandii, or the low blue. Um, they use it for all sorts of various things. I actually have a bracelet that I made from some of the fibers while I was waiting for the rain to stop one day. Um, so our first day there, we planted more Pichardia proms and other things there, and then we got to pruning the Pichardia, and that's how big the palm fronds are on that. And she's about as tall as I am, so I'm over there with a handsaw, handing these huge fronds down to her, and we made this huge pile that came up to about here. So if anybody can guess what this is. Huh? Huh? No. Huh? Red fruit. Very good. Red fruit. So this is an up close and personal view of breadfruit, and it's actually a conglomerate fruit, so each is an individual flower. So we got there, and, and this is uh, Jeff, and Jeff is like, oh, look how big this leaf is, and he like up to his hand to give you some scale. Um, I was like, I can do you one better. This, the petiole starts here, the tip of the leaf is here, and it's probably one of the biggest ones I saw while we were there. So the big thing that the NTVG does is they have the Breadfruit Institute there, and this particular plot is at the McBride Garden, and their actual um, germplasm repository is in, um, on the Kahana Garden in Maui. But they're doing um, breeding programs out here and monitoring programs to see when they flower, when they fruit, what they do when they do at certain times of year, years. And so we were actually planting and mulching and cleaning up different things here. But we did a lot of cool things with the Breadford Institute. Um, it has, this is the female structure, this is the male structure, and it has really, really pretty leaves, and the diversity is really cool. So leaves here, really lobed, leaves here, no lobes at all. You know, the fruit is this big, the fruit on that one is about this big. Diversity is amazing, and they all come from uh, Polynesia. So in these areas, uh, the Bradford Institute works with um, the natives to collect different species from the different islands, and then does cultural and nutritional information um, access. And so these are actually in, um, this is a wood panel story. This is a native um, way of telling stories. And this is a breadfruit hammer or a knife. And if you hit it hard enough, it, it's as strong as a butcher knife. And then we also got to make breadfruit flour. Um, it's, you won't see it anytime soon, sadly. Um, I wish you did though, because it tastes better than flour and it's much more nutritious. Um, this has protein, all sorts of vitamins and minerals, um, low calorie, I mean, high calorie content, which is really good for mal malnourished um, places in the world. And what they're hoping to do is introduce this as an added value, added product in uh, various countries. So here's our native plants. Um, this is a pandanus, our hala. We had the pleasure of um, dealing with this guy. Now it's a very attractive plant and it's a very dominant plant in the uh, northern part of the island but it has serrated leaves, and it shed these leaves very readily. So we had a lot of days picking up armfuls of serrated leaves and sticking them in piles, and trust me, I have the scars. Okay. Um, another thing that they had there, um, they did have sweet potatoes, and I'll have to tell you guys if you want to hear the story after my talk, um, they, this was not a European introduction. They had these before the Europeans got there. I'll just say that. Uh, and this is another lovely little, it's not native, but it's not quite as invasive as all the other non-native things. This is noni. 
and this is a particularly ripe noni that's fallen off the tree, and we smelled this before we saw it. <laughs> if anybody is familiar with noni, it smells absolutely terrible. But it, um, it's a very medicinal plant, and you can eat the fruit. It has lots of uh, good things in it for you, and they say it's a good immune booster. It's also um, good for treating wounds, and I actually used it several times to treat um, cuts that I got. And this is the um, flowering structure. This is how the fruit actually turns into this um, big, massive fruit that starts out as a clump of flowers like that. So we did do some native medicine. This is um, Uncle Richard. And so as a term of endearment to, in Hawaii, you call somebody uncle or auntie um, as, as a way of showing respect. And so this was Uncle Richard. He's from Niihau, which is um, one of, I think they call it the Forbidden Island. Um, he is a native Hawaiian. And he showed us how to make um, maternity medicine, uh, which is made out of um, pandanus root tips, um, sweet potato, uh, coconut, um, sugar cane, and nine drops from a, of sap from a banana uh, inflorescence. And so it turns out we made it in a pot, and it tastes about like a pumpkin latte, actually. It's really good. <laughs> but none of the native Hawaiians would eat it because they're like, we're guys and we're not pregnant. So, <laughs> but it was really good anyways. Um, so a couple projects that we worked on. This is the uh, Makawaki Cave. Um, and I wish I had more time to tell this story, but Dr. David Burney, who is actually from High Point, North Carolina, came to Hawaii and was working there at the NTBG. And one day, he, back in 1991, he decided to go down the side trail because he saw people going there uh, really often. And um, they were coming to see this cave, which is right in here. And this, this is actually a sinkhole. You cannot get into this except for a small little doorway down over here. You have to climb through like a little hole in the rock, crouch down, to get open, into this open place. And they were coming to see it. Well, this is what it looks like now. About 20 years ago, it was full of invasive, nasty plants. And so over 20 years, they've cleared all the invasive plants. They've planted native plants that would have been there um, and back before the Europeans got here. And they have a trail that starts at one of the hotels that ends up here. And people can go in and see the, um, the cave. And the cave is a really good, um, natural history um, uh, time capsule. What he does, he's a paleobotanist, so he goes down and digs up big buckets full of dirt and um, takes pollen samples and catalogs pollen samples, which I have a lot of respect for people who can do that. Um, also, you might not recognize it, but this was also used in Pirates of the Caribbean 4 when um, um, Johnny Depp jumped off into the, the river. This is where he jumped off. <laughs> So one of the plants that I really love at this place, and this one's really special, is the Maipilo. Uh, the Hawaiian caper is what it's called, and it has this beautiful flower on it. Um, and it's really rare to see because you have to go out there really early in the morning because as soon as sun, the sun hits it, it starts to deteriorate. So we were lucky out, to be out there early enough to see it. Um, and this is a very um, rare plant, but the hopeful story about this is they planted it out at the Makawaki Cave and it's on the up and up. They actually have, um, they have seedlings coming up without any um, help, so that's a really good sign. And this is the wall we built. Those are the rocks that we were hauling. We built this lovely wall to show uh, people where they could go up one side of the trail. Uh, another thing we did, we collected seeds. This is um, the fruiting body of a uh, Polystachys racemosa. Um, this is me, the pole pruner, pruning this whole thing off. It's really, really tall. Um, we also did some invasive plant control. And this was an invasive uh, costa. This costa is about this tall. And we spent four hours one morning chopping back an acre of it and um, garlawing it all the heck. Um, hopefully it will not come back. But sadly, it was on the other side. There's a fence around here. And it was still on the other side of the fence. So, so we can only be hopeful. We also took a trip to the um, uh, Nepali coast. If anybody knows about the Nepali coast, you definitely have to see it. It's worth a, a trip. We were fortunate enough to have somebody who, that's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> we were fortunate enough to have somebody who had a friend who could get us a really cheap boat, because usually the boat tour is about 125 ahead. I got to go on this boat tour for 30 bucks. So make friends. This is the, uh, this is that trail that I was telling you about, the Makawaki, um, 
Mahalaku Trail that goes to the Makawahi Cave, goes along the coast, and we got to see some green sea turtles out here. Um, so we did a lot of plant uh, walks with the uh, plant specialists there. This is Mike Damata, who is the director of horticulture, and he's also the director of rare and uh, native plants, and he does most of the breeding, or not breeding programs, but um, sowing and collecting programs uh, there. And this is a special cloud um, nursery that they have set up so people can see plants that they wouldn't normally be able to see. These are plants that grow on the side of cliffs up in the tops of mountains that no one would ever be able to see in their lives. And I'll say one thing about this is there are a lot of lobelias, a lot of uh, Campanulaceae in Hawaii, and a lot of these plants are in, in the Campanulaceae family. Um, and the, some of them do have spines. Some people think that Hawaiian plants don't, but they do. This is another lovely um, plant person. This is uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Uh, David Lawrence. I'm sorry I don't have a better picture of him. He uh, was helping us with the Rubiaceae collection. He's a Rubiaceae man. He loves Rubiaceae. He can talk all day. He did talk all day about Rubiaceae one day. <laughs> <laughs> but he is amazing. He is a plant authority on hundreds, if not thousands, of plants. Um, from all over Madagascar, Polynesia, anywhere. Um, a lot of times you'll see D. Lawrence, and it's this guy. He's a really nice guy, too. He's one of my favorite people. Um, and so the next person that we got to go on a walk with, we spent a whole sa Saturday um, with another gentleman. He took us um, to four different areas on Kauai to show us the different biomes, and this was one of the plants. This is actually a relative of the sunflower. Uh, it's Eliao. No one would ever know. That, that's an older that's in the sunflower family. This is um, a tea plant. So the story about this plant is um, a tea plant is a canoe plant. A canoe plant was is one of the plants that was brought by the Polynesians to Hawaii um, that they use in their native plant, a native uh, homeland. And so they use this plant as a um, as a raincoat. So if you see a plant in the wild, you know that a, a Hawaiian was there and they use it as a trail and then of course rain, so they use it as a kind of like instant raincoat place. And uh, if anybody's ever seen 51st Dates, you know, there's that funny scene where the native Hawaiian guy is like dancing and he's covered in leaves. That's actually what a native Hawaiian raincoat looks like. But they built them out of these. And this is probably the biggest one. They don't usually get this big. Uh, this is another area that took, to, took us to. This is an outplanting of very, 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 very rare plants. And they have it locked off because another problem that we have there um, our deer. The deer will come in and just completely defoliate and stomp and kill everything. And so they have this huge wire fence to protect them from the deer and the boars. Um, he was pointing out plants that was like, there's 40 of these left in the wild, and there's 100 of these left in the wild, and there's 70 of those left in the wild. All sorts of crazy numbers. And finally, this was incredible. So this kind of reminded me of home a little bit. You know, if you look out, that's kind of like a nice Blue Ridge Parkway look to it. Um, so this is the rainy side of this particular place, and this is the <coughs> other side of that same picture. Um, and this, this valley is huge. This is the Kalalau Valley. Um, and uh, you can actually hike into it, but it's not recommended. You have to leave from a place over here. It's a 12-mile hike that takes um, several, several days because, and sometimes you can't do it because of the time of the year. It's really crazy. but. The plant diversity of just seeing how um, just the microclimates was really cool. Um, so this is our, our walk to the wet side. <coughs> Tons of tree ferns. This is actually a bog area, and a lot of um, a lot of carnivorous plants live here. And there's also a lot of wild violets here. We saw a couple of those while we were there. This is another lovely gentleman. His name is Brian Yamamoto, and uh, he gave us a plant talk a couple times. Um, this is him with the more, another Morton Bay fig in another part of the garden. This particular Morton Bay fig is kind of famous because it was an, also a pirate's war when they were doing something with the mermaid. Um, this is the one that they used. So he was telling us about plants. And this is a, um, po I, I call it a poison apple. I don't exactly remember what the plant was called specifically. But if a, if a native Hawaiian had did, um, done something bad to somebody, they would have to kill themselves but they would have to do it with this plant. So they would say, they would pick two off the tree and say, choose which one you want to eat, basically. <laughs> you choose which way you want to die, and so you always want to pick the bigger one. This was the point you're trying to choose. Bigger one, because there's 
less um, poison in it, but it's still fun. <laughs> I'm going to flip to these because I don't get too close to time. Um, this is a cool point. Lots of cool plants there, so um, I do want to stop on this one though. Uh, we, you walk up the trail, and this is what you see, and it's not really all that much to write home about. But then you see this, and it's like, what is that? And so this is the fruiting body. Basically, these are the seeds out of this plant, and all along the stem are these little masses. And this particular family, uh, the one in the AC, is all of them have those fruiting bodies. And it's, Really cool. And Dr. Lawrence discovered this plant. Anyways, orchids. This is the largest orchid in the world, Rimenophyllum speciosum. They had like five of them tacked up in these palm trees like this. And you can't even tell how big this is. This thing is probably twice as tall as I am tall. Um, and it flowers. The flowers um, you know, have these huge long inflorescences that are as tall as me, and the flowers are this big. It's pretty incredible to see. Um, this is a star fruit. Um, they had a huge um, it? a plantation, basically, of all these uh, fruits. And we actually got to pick star fruit off of this tree. Never thought I'd ever do that in my life. So the other two gardens, I'm going to flip through these really fast. This is the Limapuli garden. These are loe's, which a loe is a, um, a native uh, place where they do taro, basically taro fields. And um, it was in this lovely valley, the Limapuli Awapua'a, which is their way of kind of dividing, it's kind of like cities, Hawaiian cities is your Awapua'a kind of. And this is the other side of the valley. And there we did a lot more cultural stuff. So in the Low East, they actually let us pick um, Tara for our paina, which is kind of like our end of the year, our end of our internship pala. Um, and the way that you harvest it is you use your heel, you push it down the mud, and you try to dislodge that the, the rhizome from the mother plant and it's a lot harder than you think because it hurts once you try to like wedge it down in there. But we got it. We also got to um, make lays. It taught us how to weave the tea plant into um, an actual uh, board and these lovely people made some stuff. Um, we also got to help with the Free Hollies project and this, this whip right here, we hand stripped it, stripped the bark every morning for three hours. And, um, and then in the afternoon, we would take it and we would throw buckets of salt water on it to cure it. And they're going to use this wood to make the hale, which a hale is a traditional Hawaiian house. Um, and so they're going to make a house out of this wood that we cure it. Kind of strange one. And this is a waterfall at the top of the valley that I showed you before. Um, the cool thing about Lima Puli Valley is they have this hanging shelf up here. So a hanging shelf is basically something that you have to be helicoptered into to actually get onto, and then they can hike down, but you can't hike up to it. And this is the water running down to the top of the valley. And this is the, the beginning of the, the river, and rivers are very important in their, um, in their culture. Um, and I wish I could tell you the story, but I know I'm getting close on time. This is, ask about my fishing story. Uh, let's just say I gashed my leg open and my hands open on coral reefs when the tide was coming in. It's a lot of fun. Um, this was, so the garden's over here. On the other side of the mountain, this is the um, Nepali coast. And there's a trail, the Kalalau Trail, that you could take into, um, this kind of goes halfway through the, to the Kalalau Valley that I showed you earlier. I and mean, one day we, we went on a hiking trip. The cool thing about that one, though, is you could actually see that the native Hawaiians had used it. There were bananas and, um, and the tea plants planted along the way. and. It was just really cool to see how you knew that they had used it before. Finally, the last week that we, uh, the last that, that we were there, we were on Maui. We went, we stayed in Hana for two weeks, and the Hana Valley, I mean the Hana, the road to Hana has 600 and some odd turns, and it takes about three hours to go about 20 miles. I did that three times. It was like riding a roller coaster. But this is one of the oldest taro plantations um, on the island. Um, they used this back when the Hawaiians first came, and it's still in production in some capacity. Um, this is kind of a sad story, though, because this place used to be in full production. You can see that some of these are kind of out of use. Um, drugs have been a really big problem in Hawaii and have affected this community. So this was where we stayed for two weeks. 
Um, some people stayed in cabins. I slept underneath a mosquito net for two weeks, and it was freaking amazing because this is my view. If I look to the left, it's what I would see, and if I look to the right, I would see cows, but that's okay. This is better. <laughs> so we worked at, the, this is a Mahele farm. We worked here once a week and helping with, it's basically a community garden, and all the produce went to people, uh, locals in the community, and they would come and work. It was really nice to get to know some of the native peoples. Um, here are some of them uh, doing taro. We actually, every day we would have um, a potluck, and so this, this was us actually cutting the taro that we we're going to mash up and make into a koi, which is not as bad as people think it is. Um, and we also got to eat some coconut. I was very happy about that. Um, the Kahanu Garden has a, a living germplasm repository of uh, coconut, so they just usually every day about during lunchtime they chop a couple down and Finally, we got to work on the Three Hollies project here too, but this one was, I have to say, much cooler. The structure was already there, they had the scaffolding up, they just had to put a roof on it. And so this is, uh, this is me tying string to a Chinese fan palm that had been dried that we were going to use to thatch this hut. And this is me, tie skip tie, tie skip tying these uh, Chinese fan palms to thatch this holly, and we actually got to the top and finished it. Um, and it was actually kind of an honor for me. I was the first girl who was chosen to do the tie skip tie thatching of the holly um, because usually it's still very divided there and so I was the first girl. Anyways, so we got to do some cultural things. This is the Aloha Festival and this is the, um, the, fam the overseeing family, the royal family. And so for about 10 minutes we had to stand in honor of this family walking through and this is their bidding and their parade. So these guys would walk about 10 feet, blow the horn, 10 feet, blow the horn until they made it into the court. Um, and it was really fun to watch. Also over there, since the breadfruit um, place was in Kahanu Garden, they had a breadfruit um, cook-off while we were there, which we got to judge, and which was really cool because we love fresh food. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is Ian, who is the director of that um, program. Uh, actually, this. Diane Ragoni, who is the director, but he's the one who oversees it at Kahanu. And this is him uh, thinking very hard about which one is the best. Um, after they judged it, we were all very hungry because we had to eat all day. And they said, okay, we judged it, go, ha go eat. And there was hardly any left. <laughs> so finally, I'm going to end with my trip to Haleakala. We come up this uh, volcano, this is my second volcano experience, and never. Um, so we come up this long winding road for about 30 minutes and we get to this and I'm like, oh, you know, rocks, great, some plants. And I see this and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. So it's very cold up there. I'm, I've been in Hawaii for nine weeks and I'm, it's really cold and I'm, my body's going crazy, really high up, I can't breathe, but it's still really cool because you get to see endangered species. I'm like, what endangered species? So I keep climbing, like, whoa, okay. So in the background, you can see uh, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, which are on the, um, the Big Island. So I'm a Maui, Big Island, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa right there. And here are some people right there going down the trail. So that's one side. Here's the other. And so I'm like, oh, that's really cool because you can see some of the old active volcanoes there. And then there's some stuff down here. I'm like, hmm, what's that? And I have a really good zoom on my camera. So I'm like zooming in. I'm like, oh, what are those little shiny things again? There they are. I'm like, oh, that's cool. So what I'm looking at is the Ahina Hina, and I'm not going to try to butcher that name. But the Ahina Hina is probably the cla their claim to fame up on Haleakala. It is the, uh, the Haleakala Silver Sword, um, and it is absolutely incredible. It's uh, monopodic, and usually it's um, a monocarpic, and it's usually known for its flowers because it's only flowers once, and it's a pretty tall, huge display, but I think the foliage is definitely worth it. Um, got to see this is where most of them live now a lot of them they're endangered now because of the deer and the rats and the dogs and cats and everything else that comes up and tramples them um, but here's a little guy and I saw even little guys and then I saw really big guys but I was really happy to see them so I these are actually my favorite beaches but I'm going to call it a day with that um, if you guys have any questions? Oh wait, actually no, I have to tell Tim the story. Tim asked me earlier, if you go over there, I have a little bag about this big of 
with rocks and things in it. And he's like, why did you take rocks back from Hawaii? You're not supposed to do that. And the natives tell you, everybody tells you, do not take the rocks. You know, if you move a rock, move it, put it back where you found it. And I did, I did do that a couple times, but this is my favorite beach. This is why, beach went up and up, or why not and up a beach. Uh, it means the most shimmering water. This is on Maui, this is me, the only person out there. Um, and I usually was the only person out there. Um, but those rocks came from that beach. This is my first pebble beach. And um, the reason that I say they came with me, they chose to come with me, is the back pocket of my, I had one pocket in the back of my bathing suit, and I came back to the camp one day, and those rocks were in it, and I emptied them out, because what they say is you can take them back if they choose to come with you. They have to choose to come with you. And they hopped in my pocket, and I'm like, it was my favorite beach, and I hopped in my pocket, and I'm like, I'll bring them back, and nothing bad has happened to me. In fact, I'm standing here in perfectly good health, able to tell you guys my long story about my travels, and that's what it is. I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> Any questions for Amanda? I know we have one at least over here, Amanda. Yes. Why they don't eat pineapple? Oh, oh yeah, I didn't even answer. I didn't even answer the question. So pineapple is a um, introduction, not even by Europeans, it's by Americans. Um, they just it was just a really good place for people to grow pineapple in the United States without having to import them, and so they put tons of pineapple out there. You know, adult fruits was one of the reasons why the United States actually took over Hawaii at the turn of the century. Oh, yeah. So it's not a native plant at all. Not at all. No, actually, the, the, the other place that we get most of our uh, pineapples from is Costa Rica. And we actually visited a pineapple farm in Costa Rica. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's actually not a native plant, and the Hawaiians, most Hawaiians don't even like it. Because we put it there. We, because we put it there, but it's just, it's not in their culture to eat oh. it. Yeah, they just, they eat more, they even eat less papaya. Their thing is um, uh, taro. You know, they're really big taro eaters, and taro actually has very different flavors. Most people are chai poi, and they're like, oh, it's gross. Well, depending on the variety of taro that you use, you get a different flavor. I had sour poi, I had oatmeal tasting poi, I had sweet poi, without anything added to it. So, it just depends on what you're choosing. Long answer to your question. And a tico, that was my other question. A tico is kind of an endearing term for a Costa Rican. You know, they, I'm a Tico, I'm a Costa Rican. Costa Rican come on. Yes. Bread fruit taste like? Um, it tastes like it has very different flavors. Um, it's it's very fleshy and bready, and you can make it in very different ways. We had it fried, we had it steamed, we had it baked. Um, so it depends on how you get it, it depends on what variety you get. Um, for example, the last day we were there, uh, Diane Ragoni, who was the director of the program, brought us this little brown one that she'd been baking in the oven for 40 minutes, and she cracked it open, and it was green on the inside, like lime green. And it had these huge seeds on it, and some of them have seeds and some of them don't. And it smelled really weird, it smelled kind of rubbery. And we're like, and she's like, go ahead and try it, you know, she had been eating it. It tasted like bubblegum cake. <laughs> Bubblegum cake, if you can imagine what that tasted like. And it was, it was really good. <laughs> I had a probably had, you know, good chunk of Yes? Uh, orchids aren't native to Hawaii. Either. They are not. There are only two species of native orchids, um, of which they are terrestrial and very, um, you wouldn't even know that they were there. Kind of like our native orchids here with the crane flies. Um, they are also very endangered. The native Hawaiian orchids are very endangered. Oh, it's sad we didn't see any native ones. I wish we could have, but it is what it is. I saw another hand over here. It smelled kind of rubbery. And we're like, and she's like, go ahead and try it. You know, she had been eating it. It tasted like bubblegum cake. <laughs> bubblegum cake, if you can imagine what that tasted like. And it was, it was really good. <laughs> I, have, I probably had, you know, good chunk of it. Uh, orchids aren't native to Hawaii. Either. They are not. There are only two species of native orchids, um, of which they are terrestrial and very, um, you wouldn't even know that they were there, kind of like our native orchids here with the crane flies. Um, they are also very endangered. The native Hawaiian orchids are very endangered. But, you know, it's sad we didn't see any native ones. I wish we could have. 
it is what it is. I saw another hand over here. Yes. Yeah, that slide in Costa Rica of the uh, large greenhouse. What? Was it just tall? Or was it kind of, I couldn't. Tell. It was. It was on a slope. Slope. Mm -hmm. So it, it looked tall, but it yeah. was actually just a really long complex of more like uh, shade houses <coughs> than a greenhouse. But the fact that they were there on 40 degree incline was pretty impressive. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Amanda, did you see much uh, shade grown coffee in uh, Costa Rica? We saw both shade uh, shade grown and sun grown, and we talked about. Um, the benefits um, and the downsides to both uh, production methods, but yes, we did. Um, I think that was the preferred um, way of growing it um, with the smaller producers, um, but there's also other cultural methods, but yes. So, yes. I've, uh, I've read and heard a, a bit in the past about the abuses of the banana industry, but could you uh, quickly elaborate <laughs> on your uh, admonishment about the organic bananas? Um, well, okay, so when we were at Earth University, we had the fortune of, um, if you've ever been to Whole Foods, you know, the bananas that you buy at Whole Foods, or actually some of them were grown at Earth University. They have a huge banana plantation that they teach, um, you know, about production. It's another way that they um, raise money for the university. Um, and the management practices to even manage them with that takes a lot of manpower. You have to, they have a problem with a the fungus there that is slowly you know, decimating. So they have to go through and hand cut these leaves off if they want to do it um, can, uh, organically without having to use lots of pesticides. Um, but a lot of producers don't choose to do that. They want to get it done. They don't want to send hundreds and thousands of people out into their fields every day to chop these leaves off and remove them. So they go, we, on our way to um, uh, the Mwamba village, we had to drive three hours past banana fields. It was, it was almost two, two solid hours of driving past banana plantations. And along the roads, they would have these huge um, runways for the airplanes. You know, every probably 10 miles or so runways so that planes could spray, take off the plate, spray pesticides. Um, and so I, I advocate for organic bananas. And also I advocate for <coughs> using alternate varieties. You know, the ones that you have in the store, Cavendish, um, really pretty or their yellow thing. Um, but you know, you're starting to see these smaller varieties or these different color varieties. And I advocate for those because the Cavendish is one of the, one of the varieties that's really being um, targeted by this fungus. And one of the reasons is because it's a monoculture. You know, hours and hours of the same plant, you get one, you know, outbreak of some fungus on there. It's eventually gonna spread to the entire thing. The other problem is, is you know, the, the manpower um, of cutting them down, but also taking them out. When we were at Earth University, you know, they did the best that they could, but the, the best that they could do was going through and just chopping them down. They're leaving the leaves in the field because picking them up and putting them and removing them is just another step in the process, but leaving them, you know, leaves the fungus in the field. And so the reason I advocate for it is if you push more and you put more um, pressure on these industries to use alternate varieties, you take out some of that monoculture, you you kind of begin to kind of go towards controlling some of these fungal problems. Um, and you know, you also just get the benefit of a value added product for the people who grow these things. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, actually. Um, so this is my, this is my lay, my uh, farewell lay. Um, it's made of kakui nuts. Yep, so they're really, I actually like kikui nuts um, for aesthetic reasons. They make this really pretty sound. They fall from the trees, they make these really pretty sounds because they have these really pretty hard shells that make really pretty uh, sounds. But they, a lot of times you can go there and they'll polish them up and they'll sell them as necklaces. And these are the ones that they chose to give us as thank you for coming into, you know, our family and helping us. It's a, giving people lays is a way of saying thank you and saying aloha, I love you, and for everything that you've done. Um, another story, I know, I'll, get, I'll give it a rest. The first day that we were there, they had a potluck for us, but it wasn't necessarily for us. I don't want to take credit for it. Um, a lady who had been volunteering there for probably 30 years, um, that was her retirement day. And um, we had come in and everybody who came, everybody who'd been working at the garden, who'd been a volunteer that came, gave her a lay. And some of them were bought, but a lot of them were handmade. And, the process of making a lay, the process of giving someone a lay is, 
is like a sh the ultimate show of love in the Hawaiian culture. And so she, by the time she left, she had this huge mound <laughs> of, of uh, lays of just like various kinds. Some of them were shells, some of them were plants. You know, some of them were nuts, all sorts of different things. And it smelled amazing, but it was so cool. It was a teaching moment, but it was also a moment of, you actually got to see this ultimate show of love for this person. Mm -hmm. I'll be over there. You can come look at my stuff. I'll let you guys go home. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Everybody.